Okay, welcome to this video. This is going to look at the free statistical tests that you need to know for your A-level geography. Uh, so let's get started. But before we do that, let's just quickly talk about the type of data that you can be using. So there are four types of data that you might be asked to use. <clears throat> and basically, they go in order of sort of quality, if you like, starting from nominal, moving down to ratio. Um, in simple terms, nominal data is just numbers. But they use the categories, so it might be all the shops are number one, uh, all the offices are number two. So there's no actual real use of the numbers in the sense of you know, one plus one is two or anything like that. It just simply could be A, B, C or anything like that. So that's what we call nominal data, uh, sometimes known as categorical data. Ordinal data is numbers that we put into orders. So you've got so, bipolar and you've got one score of 75 and one of 73 and you can say the 75 is better than 73. Uh, 75 better than 73. Interval data is when the gap between the, the numbers is constant, so temperature. So the gap between 5 and 10 degrees is the same between 15 and 10. Uh, that doesn't mean that 20 degrees is twice as hot as 10 degrees, because that's not how temperature works, but the, the actual degree Celsius means the same thing. So we're going from 5 to 10 or 10 to 15 or, or so on. And then the best type of data is what's called ratio data, and um, this is like interval data, but here you can use a ratio. So you can say if there's 20 cars in survey one and there are 40 cars in survey two, then one has got twice as many as, as the other. Now, most data, we, the test we're going to use, will use either ordinal interval or ratio data. Some of it will only use interval or ratio data. So there is a subtle difference between them. So you'll see these words mentioned basically just so you understand them. It's worth covering them first of all. The second thing we should cover is the idea of a hypothesis. With any statistical test, you first draw up two hypotheses. The first one is always a null hypothesis, and that this is that there is no statistical difference or correlation, um, and basically this is what you accept unless you can prove there is a statistical difference or correlation. Only if there's a statistically significant correlation do you accept the hypothesis. Okay, so we always accept a null hypothesis unless we accept the hypothesis. You can't have a situation where both are, are true. Okay, so that's the sort of basic ground rules, if you like, and, and understanding. That's how we look at the three tests. So first test, we're going to have a look at Spearman's rank. Sometimes known as Spearman's row, or Spearman's correlation, or various other names, but it's always called Spearman's. Basically, what it's doing is you've plotted some data like this, um, and you're trying to look at whether you have a positive or a negative correlation, whether you have a strong or a well, that's relatively strong, but a weaker correlation. It provides you with two things. It tells you whether the positive and the negative correlation and how strong it is. To use this, you therefore have to have two sets of variables that are correlated. The variables have to come from the same location of the person, have to be connected in some way. So basically, you might be looking at GDP and life expectancy for the same country, or you might be looking at uh, a person's uh, life expectancy and average income or something like that. So, uh, or it might be a bipolar score and a land use survey score or something like that for the same place. Uh, so they have to be connected. The other thing is it has to be monotonic. What that means is you need to be able to draw a straight line. It can't be like a hump or a curve or a, a wiggle or something like that. The line has to be that you're analysing has to be a straight line. And to be statistically, one of the 10 pairs is the normal amount of data that's normally required. Obviously, the more pairs of data you have, the stronger it is. And because it's for the same location, it has to be pairs of data. So that's when you would use Spearman's rank. So let's have a look at how you do it. Well, first of all, it's worth looking at the formula. So the formula is R, which is Spearman's rank coefficient, is 1 minus 6 sigma d squared. OK, sigma means uh, sum of d squared is this column here okay and you'll see that in this column we've worked out d squared so you don't have to actually uh, square it to do that so it's the sum of the d squares at the bottom it says n cubed minus n n is the number in this example it's 10 so that would be 10 cubed minus 10 or 990 we'll come back to that later now it's quite typical this is actually uh, example question you're asked to uh, fill in the information if in this one i've added the um the sigma uh d squared stuff down here uh, just to fill in the table now one of the things about this is i can never remember 
how to actually, whether it's this minus this or this minus this. So what I would do is actually have a look. Let's have a look here. 8, 7.5 is 0.5. So it's obviously 8 minus 7.5. So I'm going to do 9 minus 7.5. And if I do that right, it's 1.5. I then square it, which is 2.25. So I've worked out the difference and I've worked out d squared. If I want to work out sigma d squared, the sum of d squared, I simply add up all these numbers together and I'm to 18.5. So that, okay, is the number I'm going to put into here. So that's going to be my sum of d squared. So I need to just replace the numbers here. Uh, so it's 1 minus 6 times 18.5, my sigma d squared, divided by 10 over to the power of 3 minus 10 or 990. And that works out 0 0.88. It's a positive number. That suggests there's a positive correlation. It's quite a high number. One would be a perfect positive correlation. That suggests it's significant. However, what I can do is I can come over and look at the critical values. Now, our 0 0.88 is greater than 0 0.78. So because it's higher, that tells me that there is more than uh, a 99% chance that my data is more um, is significant, but it's not random. Okay, and therefore, under those circumstances, we'd accept a hypothesis. Clearly, there is a strong significance of our data, and we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that's me having a go. I want to stop the video here, have a look at this one. Uh, you'll notice that, again, another exam question. This time, it's only sigma d squared they need you to calculate and substitute that. So what I would do is I'd stop the video, I'd have a go at working that out, and then compare it to my answers in a second. Okay, so I hope you had a go. Let's have a look and see how I did this. So uh, sigma d squared was 109, so 6 times 109. Again, you've got 10 examples, so that's 10 cubed, which is 1,000 minus 10, so it's going to be 990. Uh, 1 minus that lot gives me a positive score of plus 0.34. Plus suggests that there is actually a positive correlation, but 0.34 is quite a low number. And certainly, given the uh, fact we've only got 10, the chances are that that's not going to be critical. But we do the same thing as before. So we have a look here. We can see that our number, 0.3, whatever it was, is less than uh, the 90% significance mark. Therefore, it's not significant. In fact, most scientific papers require it to be at 95% significance. This isn't even at 10% significance or 90% significance, sorry. Uh, so it wouldn't be accepted. There's a high chance that this is uh, a random numbers and other factors. Uh, in this case, for example, the height of the land or the proximity to the, um, to the epicenter or just the vulnerability had more impact here. So basically for this question, you'd say you'd accept the null hypothesis because actually your data is less than the, the significant level. Okay, so that's uh, two examples. If you want, I'm not gonna work this one out for you, uh, but you can have a go at, at this. Again, you should find this at the end of the PowerPoint if you want to print it out. But in this example, uh, you'll need to work out D and then D squared. Uh, they have been slightly naughty here if you have a look. Um, so, for example, 9 and 8, well, that implies 8, 9 minus 8 is 1. If you look over here, 3 minus 4 should be minus 1. Actually, it doesn't make a lot of difference because when you square it, um, you get rid of the minus numbers. Um, but yeah, you should try and be consistent when you're doing this. And I would say they've just simply missed out a minus number there. But anyway, you have a go at that. You can see what the uh, R comes out and whether it's significant. Okay, so moving on quickly, we're now going to have a look at the most complicated, well, I think it's the most complicated one, which is the t-test. Now, the t-test doesn't look for a correlation, it looks for a difference between sets of data. It's a test of difference. And it does that by comparing the means of two sets of data. And because you're doing two sets of data, those data there has to be unrelated groups. So you cannot have a, a possibility of someone being in both groups. So male and female works, um, but you can't have I don't know, um, Sagittarius and female, for example. Okay, they have to be distinct unrelated groups. The data has to be normally distributed. That simply means if you plot it on a histogram, it would look like a, a smooth curve. 
and it gives integral ratio data, i.e. these numerical values that you're using. There is no minimum sample size, but 20 to 30 is considered the norm, and the more you've got, the more powerful the test is. In fact, um, you know, 20 to 30 would be a good size, you'll probably be given a sample of 10. Again, that seems to be the, the sort of norm. That degrees of calculation. Uh, freedom is calculated using the sample size minus 2, so n minus 2. Um, and again, you need to think about hypotheses. Hypothesis is that always will be the statistical difference. And the null hypothesis is no statistical difference. So that's how you approach that. Now, the form of this looks a bit frightening. Uh, it's got lots of numbers and letters and things like that. Actually, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You just need to understand what it means. So x1 with a bar across it simply means the mean, the average of sample 1, and x2 would be sample 2. S1 and S2 are the standard deviations. It's highly unlikely you'd be asked to calculate that, but if you were, you'd simply do that and you'd just have to run to square it. And N1 is the number in the sample for data set 1 and data set 2. It's unlikely you'd be asked to actually work through and do this because actually that's quite a tricky old formula to do. If you do, then it's a level playing field, everyone has the same task. However, the only exam question that they've produced with the t test looks like this. And what you'll see here is they've done standard deviation for you, uh, they've done uh, for site A and site B, they've done the difference in means, which is quite a significant difference, and they've calculated uh, the t test score. So you haven't, they've done that formula for you basically. Remember standard deviation is just a measure of how spread out the data is. And what we can see here is that one set of data is far more spread out than the other. And the difference in means would suggest that actually there's a substantial difference in the size uh, of the class. What we'll see is the t-test score is 5.9. The critical value for 90% confidence is 1.9. So using that logic, the t-test score is higher than the critical value. We'd accept that that's statistically significant, which means that we should accept the hypothesis. The reason for accepting it is that it's higher than the critical value. So that's the only question I've seen. That seems quite straightforward about understanding what the t-test is rather than having to plunk data into it and, and calculate it. But you may be given most of the data and just asked to calculate it. I don't know. Now, moving on to the last of the three tests we're going to look at, that's the chi-squared test. This is a comparative test. Uh, it's sort of looking at whether uh, data is uh, similar or not. And to do this, you need to have a number of categories, okay, and you're looking at frequency data for that. So it's a number of cars, vans you use, a number of male, female, the number of shops, or something like that. That has to be over 20 observations in total, and that will look at the example that the exam board have given, and we'll have a look at why it's actually not right in a second. Because uh, in addition to 20 observations, each category must be expected to have more than four. The observations are independent, so again, male-female works, but not brown eyes and versus brown hair, because someone would have both. And degrees of freedom in the simplest form is number of categories minus one. Okay. Um, so that's when you use it. This is what the formula looks like, a bit simpler than the t-test. So x squared, that's the chi-squared value, is the sum of O minus E squared um, divided by E squared, where O is your observed results, E are the expected results, so you work out that square and then divide it by E. Uh, and I say sigma is just the sum of. Okay, so what does this look like? So this is the uh, example that they've produced for us, and you've got some data here, and you've got the number of people answering disagree that Media City UK has been beneficial to all people in town. It's just a sort of a suitable null hypothesis. Remember, there's no statistical difference. Uh, so there would be no statistical significant difference between um, people's opinions about uh, Media City uh, between the categories, something like that. Basically, there's nothing significant going to happen. Okay, how do you do this? Well, well you draw up a table like this. You will see uh, that there are four categories. And uh, what we will do is use the n minus uh, 1. Uh, so, in fact, that should be 3. And uh, the critical value is correct. Um, and you simply have to fill in this table here. So, if again, 
when you get given one of these, the good thing is they've always worked some of it out for you. So one uh, observed expected is three, so observed minus expected is minus two. So you can quickly work it out five, three, there's going to be plus two, isn't it? Uh, once you've got that, you've then got um, this, which is our little formula. O minus squared divided by E squared, sorry, O minus E squared divided by E. So we can work that out because there is the same as X squared. We need to know the sum of that. And so the sum of that is going to be, let's have a look, 3.9. The critical value is 5.9. Um, therefore, actually, it's not significant. So we'd reject the uh, hypothesis and we would accept the, the no hypothesis. Anyway, I hope that is uh, been useful. Like I say, they're all the examples from the materials produced by the exam board. We talked through each of them. Uh, hopefully that will give you uh, some confidence in answering these. I so said they're not particularly scary. Make sure you've got a scientific calculator with you. Look at the uh, materials that are provided. They'll give you clues. And it's really a question of substituting in and understanding the null and the, the hypothesis. So I hope that's given you the confidence. Um, there are sections in the AS textbook on this which you can look at. You have also plenty of good videos on YouTube, but if you're still stuck, feel free to email me. So good luck and I hope that helps. Yes.